So I just need a comparison. Okay, I'm going to call to order the policy committee meeting of AMATS, February 26th. It's 1.30. We have Mr. Flynn, Mr. Steele, Mr. Peterson from the assembly here. Mr. Sullivan is here representing the mayor. Ms. Heil is here representing ADC. <laughs> a darn good job. It's <laughs> and of course, uh, Mr. Campbell is obviously here representing the DOT. So which two of the assembly members will be voting today, please? Uh, we will. Flynn and Steele. Yes, thank, you. thank you. Okay, Craig, can you take us through our public involvement announcement? Well, all AMATS meetings are public meetings and the public is invited to comment. If we have a business item, we'll have a presentation by staff or a consultant. Uh, the committee will then be given a chance to discuss it and then the public will be invited to comment. Uh, in addition, if the public is uh, commenting, if they can state their name and uh, spell out their last name if it's confusing for us so we get it for the record, that'd be great. Thank you. In front of us in this salmon colored piece of paper is our agenda. Does anybody have a correction or modification to the agenda? Moved and seconded. Any objections to the agenda? Seeing none, the agenda is approved. We have minutes from January 22nd in our packet, I believe. I'll move to approve and compliment staff on the very prompt production of their house. Second. Moved and seconded. Ms. Hile? I say, are you taking breath? No. Comment? No? Okay. <coughs> Objection to the minutes as presented? Seeing none, those minutes are now adopted. Thank you. Business items, we have an operating agreement revision, Mr. Lyon. So you have uh, three pages that go with that. There's a memo in front, an addendum sheet, and some, actually I apologize, just two pages. The, the bylaws are for the next item. Sorry for that. So the first two pages, just the addendum sheet and the memo itself. This has been kicking around for a little while, the revision. And it's gone through uh, some more sessions and TAC meetings, et cetera, et cetera. The original proposal was to, to do two things. One was to change the, let the S in the, in the name of AMATS from uh, solutions to the word system. And the second one, second part of the amendment or the operating agreement revision was the creation of a separate standalone citizen advisory committee. Um, the TAC at their February I believe it was their 12th meeting, uh, considered this and they voted uh, four to three to not change the name from solutions to system and they voted, or, yeah, they voted unanimously to recommend the, the, the creation of the uh, Senate Advisory Committee. They recommended for you to release this, uh, this amendment, this revision to the operating agreement for 30 day public review. So um, I have in the memo there, the last time the policy committee uh, had this had this topic up for discussion, there was a question about how long AMATS has had one, is it a federal requirement, uh, how many MPOs around the country uh, have a citizen advisory committee, and so I have included a lot of information in there about that, talking about how AMATS has had a citizen advisory committee at least as early as 1978, um, and at 1984 through 86 there was a hybrid one and then in 1986 is when we started using the Planning and Zoning Commission as our Citizens Advisory Committee. Um, the the uh, only information that I was able to find regarding places around the country and how many other MPOs around the country have this sort of thing was a, uh, a study of MPOs in 2010. There are about 350 MPOs in in uh, in existence at that time, and at that time when they did the study of those that responded, about 41 percent of the MPOs had a citizens advisory committee. So clearly, the majority did not um, of the ones that were surveyed or the ones that responded to the survey. I guess um, it is not a requirement of federal law to have a citizens advisory committee. As a matter of fact, the only requirement in federal law is to have a policy board. So the Freight Committee, the Senate Advisory Committee, the Technical Advisory Committee, all of those are not required by federal law. So uh, the only one that is required is the Policy Board. So um, I think that kind of 
gives you all the information you're looking for, if I remember correctly, but I'm happy to answer other questions regarding that. Again, the TAC recommended it. this proposal be released for 30-day public review, the Citizens Advisory Committee formation, and uh, but not the part of the operating agreement with the name change. Okay, I'd like to take these as two separate items. We've got the name change and we've got the Citizens Advisory Committee. So let's talk about the Citizens Advisory Committee first. I think it's the more important of the two. So, Mr. Flynn? Yeah, and I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this, but I just want to make sure. Does this constitute a major amendment to our operating agreement and therefore open it up to, we'll call it modernization under federal law? <laughs> The, the term that you are looking for is redesignation, and this would not constitute an amendment that requires a redesignation. Um, AMATS is unique, as far as I can tell, as the only MPO around the country that only has one local government unit in it. We only have the municipality of Anchorage. If you are going to change the membership of your policy committee, if you're going to have another city come into your MPO, then that would constitute a redesignation because you're changing the signatories to the uh, agreement. In this case, the mayor of Anchorage and the governor of the state are the two signatories. Other than that, you're not redesignating. So this change would not require a redesignation. That's what I thought. But it's a good point. I'm cautious about that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We all should be. Further questions or comments, Mr. Flynn? Um, no. When we, we get, we get, always when we get to part two, we'll okay. talk about that. Mr. Steele? It seems to me we want a citizen's advisory committee. Okay. Mr. Mills? I disagree. I think we, um, I think uh, the majority clearly don't, and I think there's a reason. I think they want this body to function efficiently. And what we've done different than, um, as is not required, as Mr. Lyons mentioned, we have the, you know, the great advisory, we've got the pedestrian, bicycle. We get citizen input on those key elements of the decisions we make. In addition to the Technical Advisory Commission, which of course has a public process, our policy committee, which has a public process, so I think it adds a, an extra layer. I've heard from you know Mr. Lyons and others that maybe P and Z uh, can be cumbersome sometimes, and um, I'm not sure that they've ever in those 20 plus years that they've been there have really um, applied, uh, I guess, meaningful dialogue or changes you know to what we end up doing anyway. Um, maybe I'm wrong on that, but I mean, your history, Mr. Lyons, seems to suggest that um, it's more of a time consuming thing rather than a productive value um, organization as regards AMAT. So um, I think we have um, an inordinate public process, especially with all the subcommittees that we have involved with our process. Okay. Anything further? No. Ms. Howell? Well, I, I would suggest before we get into the actual decision on that would be to look at the bylaws because they kind of go hand in hand and the reason i say that is the way this committee is intended to be set up there is different than what the pnc would be was proposed from what the technical advisory committee is forwarding to us and that is to have members from each assembly district the community um, federation of community councils a chamber of commerce member the chugaki river chamber of commerce member and a planning and one planning and zoning commission that's a totally different makeup and input that could be very valuable to um, the plans we don't have at this time. And um, while it's very cumbersome with the PNZ, I think having its own citizens or advisory committee and maybe adjusting the uh, bylaws to make it very clear that the committee only functions as needed as with work tasks very specifically um, given to them through the AMAS or uh, the policy committee or the technical committee, that it wouldn't get too, you know, overwhelming. But it could provide some very um, helpful information when we're reviewing the, the different plans we have. It may not be required, but we do are required to do public participation. And our public development pro program, and it's really hard to get additional input from various levels of the community and meet all those requirements without some type of a vehicle. And this is more of a, a widespread where we have the individual committees for freight, bike, and, and air, but there's still some huge areas within our community that we're not getting reaching very well. And so this might be a way this might, to try it out, but this might be a way to do that. So I just call attention to 
what the membership of this committee would be as as a different way of looking at the community as a whole. Thank you. Does anybody from the public have comments they'd like to make on this proposed action? It's poker players, they're all poker players. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would move that um, we release, uh, I guess it would be section 5.21 and 5.4 for public comment. Um, I would appreciate the mayor's comments, but I think it's reasonable at least to get public feedback uh, on this before we make a final decision as to whether we think this move is the correct one. Second. Moved and seconded. Okay, further discussion then. Mr. Flynn, anything further you care to say? No, thank you, sir. Mr. Steele, further comment? Uh, I, I think uh, I think it's a good recommendation to get a little more input, specifically the community councils. Okay. Mr. Mayor, any further comments? Well, just one. I mean, we the community councils it brings up a good point. I mean, clearly, um, as a nine-year assembly member, there's no lack of public process involved as an assembly member hearing from the five community councils that I represented on what key road and trail and uh, transportation projects in each district um, were transmitted to the assembly uh, through their members on an annual constant basis. So I just think the process already exists through the councils, through the assembly members, several of which are then appointed AMS to represent that viewpoint. Um, and so I, I just think it's a a necessary extra layer I'll be voting no. Are you proposing eliminating P and Z also from the comment block in your absolutely in your story? So you think yep. that we should do away with any citizens advisory committee yep. specifically and rely on our subcommittees that we've got right now yep. and, and, and again as well as the community councils and working through their assembly. The process is already in place. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Ms. Howe, any further comments? Mr. Chair, can I just share one little thing that might have some insight is the fact that when we do have large plans that go out for review, typically we create a separate citizen advisory committee. So when we do an MTP update, we usually create that. So the, besides the citizen advisory committee, there are other areas to there where the public would be available to comment. You know, this was a staff proposal, so, so clearly I'm supportive of it, but but I just wanted to give that information that we, there are other opportunities and avenues that we utilize. Yeah, I, I guess I'm going to weigh in a little bit here and say that I think I philosophically agree with the mayor on this, that, that we've got a lot of public involvement that we do um, on all of our programs, projects, everything we do, it seems like, is open to public comment at every step of the way. and it. it I'm not sure if I had to choose between a CAC and a PNZ, that might be one thing, but I guess I'm kind of thinking along the lines of the mayor is I'm not sure we need either one really. But at this point, the issue before us is not whether we need them, it's whether we release this for um, public comment. So with that, I believe we are not going to get unanimous consent on this. So I will start with Mr. Flynn. I believe the motion before us is to release this item for public comment. Bylaws the bylaws of the AMATS Citizen Advisory Committee. I'll, I'll vote yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I'll vote yes. Mr. Mayor? No. Ms. Heil? Yes. I believe I will vote yes also. So now let's take on the second issue here, which is kind of a thorn <laughs> in my side, personally. I don't even know why. It seems like such a trivial thing. System solutions. But this continual revisiting of the change of the name of this thing, I guess to steal somebody else's joke in our department by changing it from solutions to systems, are we admitting we've given up and solving anything? Is that what we're trying to say here? <laughs> we, we can't find solutions anymore, so we're giving up and changing our name. Um, comment, if you want, comment, or you want to start I think I'm school? done with my comments. Mr. Flynn, why don't you start with a reasonable <laughs> comment, please? <laughs> Well, uh, it's sort of hard to follow that, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> I, I have noticed that we do a good job of changing our acronyms periodically just to make sure nobody can actually understand what we're doing. <laughs> LRTP, MTP. Might fit into that system, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe you've discovered a pattern. Um, I mean, I, I have no problem releasing this for 
discussion. Uh, I, I do think system has some merit given that, at least in theory, we're trying to integrate motorized, non-motorized, mass transit, etc. And that is a system as opposed to a solution. A solution. Um, but, but um, you know, I'm semantics anyway, so. Mr. Steele, any comments? I don't care. <laughs> Mr. Mayor. And I don't want to spend too much time on it. Um, you could wordsmith things to death, but I'm fine with it the way it is. I think everybody understands that we have a transportation system. That's the world we live in. But I think it's a better action where it is solutions because our job is to make that system work better. And hence the name solutions is being applied to our system to make it more functional. So I like the way it is. Thank you. Ms. Heil? I don't think it should even be on the agenda. <laughs> the Technical uh, Advisory Committee made a recommendation, the only recommendation they forwarded was to release for public comment the edits. The edit of um, the system should never have been on here. The, the memo should never have had it on. I have no problem with if, if staff has a desire to bring additional information to um, the policy committee by putting a note, the staff thinks we should do this or, or whatever, but the actual TAC and motion was to strike it and it shouldn't be even be here so I assume that means you're strongly against releasing this I don't even think it, yeah okay. I don't think it should be a release it should just be where it, what it is <coughs> it was not boarded by the formal recommendation by the technical advisory committee can I speak to that briefly Mr. Chairman yes I appreciate Ms. Hiles' comments, and of course, she's been a long-time member of the technical committee and does a mm -hmm. lot of good work for us. However, um, to the best of my knowledge, the policy committee has never delegated our authority to the technical advisory committee, and giving them veto power, I think, is an, it be not, would not be appropriate unless we're going to make a conscious decision to do that. And that's what I meant. Yeah, okay. uh, yeah, let's, I don't want to have a debate here. You guys can talk later if you need to. Um, I understand. I think both your points. Thank you. Does anybody from the public have a comment on this release of this name change? Okay. Mr. Mr. Chair, I'll move. Oh, sorry. Could, could I just make a quick comment on why staff was suggested this? Against my better judgment, please do. <laughs> I'll, I'll be very, uh, very brief. And while I appreciate uh, Ms. Heil's opinion, you know, I, whenever we've done uh, plans or anything that we've worked on before, we usually, because there are typically a lot of comments, we have comment matrix, and we start with the staff recommendation, and then the TAC view, and the PNZ view, and the assembly view, etc. And then the policy committee decides. That's why it was left on the the memo because the original was to change the name and, and it was the policy committee again the only one that is required by federal law is the one who decides and staff wanted suggested this change because there are no other MPOs around the country that use the word solution they use system for the most part and it suggests the uh, integrated system that we're trying to work on with the roadway system and the you know the non motorized system and the trans transit system and so um, in order to try to have some continuity with other MPOs, certainly in this state, Fairbanks, which uses system, um, and to uh, kind of suggest the idea that we're trying to create this system, that's why we suggested it. So just a little background on that. Thank you. Motion, please. I move to uh, keep the name as it is. Second. I think the question at hand is whether we release it for public comment. Yeah, so can we have a motion relating to the agenda item, which I believe, well, it doesn't really say in the agenda item, but I think it was presented as release for public comment, but I think that we may end up in the same place. Can you restructure your motion, Mr. Mayor? As I read through the memo, I you prefer Mr. Mayor, I'll make the motion so you don't have to do No, no, well, this is, so. this is me what's in front of us first because I, I don't really see in here where it says, but the question before us is to release it for public comment. Am I well, the, last the operating agreement revision, which is before you, is being asked to be released for public review. And so this was one of the two parts to the operating agreement. We basically divided the question. If you look at the, at the rear of your this is like the back the last page, the last line is recommended to release the operating agreement revision, which is a little duplicitous since they actually did not support 
That's this not that. that was but I go back to the second paragraph, the <laughs> first paragraph, second paragraph, where it says, TAC voted four to three not to recommend the change. So to me, that's the question in front of us. Do we go along with the TAC's recommendation or do we not? Um, but we can do it either way. You, a friendly amendment to the motion is fine, Mr. Frank. Mr. Mayor, for, for the sake of what I think is the appropriate process, I will make the motion, um, suggest we amend the motion to whether or not we release uh, the change from solution to systems for public comment. I accept that as a friendly amendment. I don't know if Mr. Ms. Heil oh, that's fine. the second. No, we, can, we can call it. <laughs> <laughs> so I believe that we've got an amended motion now which says should we release the recommended name or the proposed name change for public comment? Is that the motion? Everybody's understanding? Yep. Further discussion? Mr. Flynn? Mr. Steele? No, thank you. Mr. Sullivan? Refuse to say another word about it. Ms. Heil? <laughs> Mr. Flynn, your vote? Why not? Yes. Mr. Yes. Steele? Mr. No. Mayor? No. Ms. Heil? No. I also vote no. Motion fails three to two. <clears throat> Next item. Citizens Advisory Committee Bylaws, number B, 5B, Craig. So these would be the specific bylaws for that Citizens Advisory Committee if uh, if you decide to approve your operating agreement revision. When we originally, uh, this brought, was brought before you, it was just uh, the idea that we would create a separate Citizens Advisory Committee. The Technical Committee wanted to have a draft set of bylaws to be released at the same time. So. So to be clear, these are to be released also concurrent with the concept, is that? Yes, that was what their recommendation was. Okay, so this is a release. Okay. Mr. Flynn, Mr. Steele, Mr. Sullivan. So? No, quiet. Public comment. We're running, obviously running out of words up here. I see the day. No? No from the public either? Motion. Move to release. Second. Motion. Moved and seconded to release. Any further discussion, anyone? Any objection to releasing these? Mr. Saul, okay. Let's have a vote. Mr. Flynn? Yes. Mr. Steele? Yes. Mr. Sullivan? No. Ms. Heil? Yes. I will vote yes also. Four to one, that motion passes. Next, BPAC appointment, Zach Fields. The uh, Bicycle and Pedestrian Committee uh, has a number of public members, and then they have some members designated by a certain uh, specialty. In this case, this is a uh, social services seat. Uh, Mr. Fields is a member of the Anchorage Youth, a board member of the Anchorage Youth Court, and those are meetings that occur uh, fairly regularly. I believe at least once a month, if not more. This has been a challenging position to fill. We had a position, a person in this position when we first created the committee and then haven't had it for well over a year and a half, maybe two years. So um, this is a recommendation uh, which went through the TAC and they recommended unanimously to appoint Mr. Fields to the social services seat. And I believe that is the only seat currently. Yeah, so that is the only one that is up right now. We have no reappointments on this. Comments, Mr. Flynn? Mr. Steele? Mr. Mayor? Ms. Hall? Yes. I guess I've got a, a question. What was the intent behind the social services seat in this organization? I, I'm not questioning Mr. Fields, but it seems like he's a remotely linked to social services. And I was wondering if there was some thought about what viewpoint he was supposed to be representing on this and how his appointment to this chair would be consistent with that well um, what, what I can say is that you know the uh, social services seat I think people normally would look at something like uh, Catholic Social Services or Lutheran Social Services United Way um, something uh, along that field to the idea being they would bring their perspective to the committee right um, and I uh, can't remember who the person was before or what, what, what group they were in before, but again, this has been really challenging to try and fill this seat. We've reached out a number of times and been una unable to. Um, and so we figured uh, Mr. Fields, one, is interested, which 
a lot of the time we have uh, seats that open up and we say, oh, so you're with the school district, so we'll put you on there, and then the person doesn't show up, and, and then we have to refill it again later on. And so someone who's actually interested to begin with is a good step, and then it, it does kind of, again, kind of fit the bill. The Anchorage Youth Court is a social services organization to a degree, um, and it's not a board that meets once a quarter or twice a year. They meet at least once a month, if not more. So these regularly would be going to that group. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Craig. Again, it's. <clears throat> if I might just interject too, I believe Mr. Fields and has. Joni is the sorry. staff to the bike and ped committee. The pack. I, I believe Mr. Fields has extensive volunteering experience, although he doesn't directly work for social services and has volunteered quite a bit with United Way and some of those other organizations. I hate yeah. to pick on Mr. Fields. I'm sure he's a great person. I just am questioning kind of his relation to this seat. It appears he's a volunteer for youth court. He's not actually a social services worker or anything else, and it, it just seems like he may not represent what we were looking for. But as you point out, is having a vacant chair representing anything either? You know, it's not like that's really and, a, uh, a win situation either if we can't find anybody. So um, we're happy to continue enough. looking if. if if it seems a little tenuous. I mean, well, if I may, Mr. Chairman, the mayor and I have spent some time working on making sure that youth court is funded and moving forward. And, um, and part of the reason I think we share uh, uh, an enthusiasm for it is because it's trying to reach youth who, frankly, are at risk in our community. Um, and one of the ways we facilitate them transitioning from perhaps the wrong path to the right path is through transit. Uh, and I think I actually know Mr. Fields a little bit. He's uh, communicated with me on some issues in, in the neighborhood. And uh, I don't have anything against Mr. Fields. Yeah, no, no, I'm just questioning the linkage. My, but my, my point is, I, I know his passion for youth is the kind of advocacy we want. It's not perhaps all encompassing. I think, for example, if we had Michelle Brown available from the United Way, that would be tremendous. But she's a busy lady. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> I take your point. Thank you. Um, does anybody from the public have any testimony they'd care to give on Mr. Fields' candidacy? Is he here? I don't know if he's, he's not here. 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 He was at the TAC meeting, but he's not here today. Can I have a motion, please? Move to approve. Second. Moved and second. Any further discussion? Anybody opposed to Mr. Fields being presented? Okay, Mr. Fields is now appointed. Uh, next is our, I'm not going to try to say this, AAQAC. <laughs> is there a clever way to say that, Craig, that I'm not aware of? Hey, you just did. <laughs> um, Andrew Holmes is the nominee for this um, Air Quality Advisory Committee. And uh, we have three reappointments. Uh, John Spring is the PNZ, or sorry, two reappointments. John Spring is the PNZ rep, and Kimberly, Dr. Morgan, as a health, I think it's health professional representative. So, um, uh, Mr. Ohms is a transportation engineer with Kittleson Associates, and he also serves on the Municipal Public Transit Advisory Board. So, he would be the Public Transit Advisory Board representative to this committee, um, which is what uh, he, he's replacing Jedediah Smith on the committee. So. Uh, TAC met and recommended the two reappointments and the new appointment. As far as I can see, they are not in the room. Any discussion, Mr. Flynn? Mr. Steele? Second. Moved and seconded. Okay, comment? Comment first. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Transmit any, <laughs> any public comment or any three of the candidates here? Seeing none, any objection to reappointment and new appointment of these candidates as presented? Seeing none, those are approved. Other business items, do we have any other business items? Informational items, we've got four or five informational items today, so let's be brief with our information, shall we? Gamble Street, Mr. Jackson, are you doing Gamble Street? I'm not. Who's doing Gamble Street? I believe the city might be starting, or Craig, if you want to mention it. <laughs> <laughs> Craig, I don't have any other insight than other than uh, the last time this was uh, before okay. our committee, we had we a request for an update. So, 
Scott Thomas is our Central Region Transportation Engineer. I guess even though he's not the project manager of this project, I guess he's been somehow he's elected here. to present here today. I won't give you a project update so much as a statement that I've, I've reviewed documents by consultants for the Fairview Business District and uh, the initial finding of those documents are that three lanes can work on Gamble Street and uh, what I brought was, uh, I like to do an independent review of that and what I brought was uh, a little bit of history, the chart of Alaska population and it shows that things go up and they go down and but overall uh, without any major change we I would expect on the second page that there's going to eventually be some more growth so when you try to make something work at three lanes what we have to watch out for is um, growth and reserve capacity um, and when I test our historical volumes on these charts I get things to work in the middle but not on the end that's basically the point is the ends have a lot of traffic competing for the intersections and, and take some special care. The middle, ends. Uh, I'm sorry, 5th and 6th Avenue pivoting with Ingrid Gamble and 15th. And, and the consultant's work today shows that 15th is going to be really difficult. And I, how you make the transition to these endpoints is, is the tricky part. The middle doesn't have a lot of competing volume and, uh, and, and it will work barring any It'll work under normal low growth, but if we get any big surprises and big booms, then, then we would even have to reassess the middle. But I'm using historical traffic volumes as my guide, like 2005 was the, and through 2007 was the last real peak, and sure, we've seen a drop in traffic. But as history shows on my second chart, uh, from the middle 80s forward, we, we rebound, and so we just have to be ready for that with the space we have so that's a, it's an initial review of the report okay. that's, that's all I have, so. thank you well I'm sure there'll be a few questions mr. Flynn if you want to sure you've assimilated all this and got your yeah uh, as you I'm sure note from your salmon cover sheet colored sheet wasn't available prior to the meeting, so I had not a chance to even look at it. Right. Um, so let me, while you're reviewing that stuff, let me give you a little distraction then to think about. Um, the Gamble Street project, and I'm not the project manager either, but I'll tell you that in general what it is is a repaving, you know, originally um, proposed within our department as a rehabilitation of the existing pavement. And I believe it was basically between 5th, 6th Avenue and 36th Avenue. Uh, I think it's about a $7 million project right now, of which the part on Gamble Street then, if you break it down, it's probably less than a million dollars worth of asphalt in that area. It's not a huge dollar value. Our schedule has it being paid this summer. Some of the stuff that we've looked at in the Fairview um, community's interest in terms of reducing the lanes out there is not just a matter of restriping, which would probably be a fairly expensive thing when we move the signal heads and striping itself would be expensive. but. The components that were really expensive was when you move the sidewalks, you move the utilities, you the utilities underground. Um, some of our estimates were in the tens of millions of dollars for that section of road to have those types of facilities done. So the restriping part is really not a big deal at all. It's the moving the curb lines that's really the big deal. And so I'm going to put forward two things here. Number one, I don't think right now there's any money available to do $30 million worth of utility work out there in that Fairview quarter. Right? We don't have it, and I don't see anybody else coming up with it. Um, paving this road this summer is not going to be a huge investment of money that we're going to throw away, even if two years from now we get out there and have to move some curb lines. It's not that big a deal. The second thing is I've talked with our commissioner about the highway to highway concept, and he has um, requested a couple of well, he really requested. He said he's going to take a couple of weeks and present this to the governor. So we may be back in a position where we can reformalize that project again in the near future. I say that because currently the past administration had no love for that project at all, as you may recall. I think um, I pointed that out, sir. I believe I had to elicit that information. I couldn't even <laughs> say the word for fear of being said packet, but um, it's stricken from our vocabulary. The, um, so that project may be um, re-examined within the current leadership of the department and the administration and we may be able to find a way to get that project revitalized which i think we all agree is ultimately the long-term solution and this body has never 
truck it from the from our plans. You know, we've kept it in our plans the whole time. So I offer that as a a uh, a thing to look forward to, and perhaps an area where people that are interested can try to weigh in politically in the next month or so if they think there's uh, support out there for that project to be revitalized. So those are the two things I would offer to distract you from the traffic numbers that were probably pretty confusing. <laughs> no, I, I actually know how to read. Do you know how to understand? Not necessarily. Mr. Chairman, um, just it would be perhaps edifying, if not necessarily for the entire body, at least for myself, to have a little bit more um, of the background to your internal deliberations on this topic, just so that I have a clear picture of you know what the department's feeling is. I mean, this, this is a start. Um, yeah, I think that um, from my perspective, I'll give you a very short view of it, that you know, this is our interstate highway in Anchorage. It's the primary connection between the north and the south part of our states. Goes right through that corridor. It's, you know, we need to have that type of capacity in our system. And if we displace capacity out of our system in some location, it goes somewhere else. Tudor Muldoon right now is clearly not a place that has excess capacity. When you look at C Street and A Street, those, those are off, you know, those are in the wrong direction. Ingrid Gamble is kind of further to the east to the east and there's a tremendous flow of traffic that goes kind of north south and east out of this town and so uh, my concern has always been that reducing that or creating a choke point there was something that was going to do ill service to the rest of the state obviously the Fairview community has a strong interest in their location and I understand that I get it hundred percent but without a reasonable alternative I didn't feel that the department was in a position to move forward with that project without having a reasonable alternative of development in some way that we could say we could handle future growth or existing traffic for that matter. That's it, nickel summary. Um, if the commissioner uh, has the opportunity to have that conversation with the governor, um, the interesting idea that someone brought my way, which I'm not sure is feasible or not, but once the great state of Washington finally figures out how to get their Bertha, Bertha fixed <laughs> and complete their project, pick it up at surplus and use that <laughs> go under Merrill Field. <laughs> okay. I have no idea if it's even slightly practical, but it sounded interesting. There's a landfill. There's a landfill. Should be easier to get through. It does sound interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Thank you. Mr. Steele? I, I know that we do have some participation, some folks that want to comment on this too, so hopefully you have that penciled in. Well, this is an informational item. There's no action here. I guess were you thinking they had additional information? Or yeah, were they just going some to more information. Yet again, berate me for my position on this project. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Mr. Mayor, do you have any further comments? No. Uh, I will reluctantly. I know I did. I'm gonna I'm gonna go again into the deep end of the pool here without my life jacket. Um, is there anybody from the public that would care to comment on this information item? Yes, sir. I promise not to be right. Funny you should ask. You're one of the few that has made that promise. All right. I, no, and I'll I'll stand by my promise. Christopher Concept for the record. Um, I see this new uh, set of data, and I actually really appreciate it because. It points to uh, the corner of 5th, 6th, Gamble, and Ingra as a real problem. And uh, 15th and Gamble, the studies that we performed showed that with a little bit of adjustment at that intersection, we could actually maintain healthy flows. And so what I've done is prepared a packet for each of the members and the staff of the materials that we've presented, put together, cobbled you state and municipal funds and sweat and labor and love to move forward. And uh, so some of you have seen some of it, some of you might have seen all of it. And I'll just, this will just take two minutes, really. On the top, this is the study of the implementation plan of the Gamble Street renovation. It's a lot of information, but using DOT's model, we've shown that it's feasible. The issue we're aiming for is not necessarily to just narrow down the lanes, put it on a diet to three lanes, but 
if you go through the materials, it, there's a packet with a paper clip in there. It's all of the votes that the assembly has approved and that the mayor has allowed to become law in the municipality, as well as the findings of the Planning and Zoning Commission that Gamble Street is unsafe for pedestrians and for cars. That's the finding of the municipality's own body and approved by the assembly and the mayor in the Fairview neighborhood plan that was passed forward. And so while we recognize this is an important statewide facility, it's an unsafe statewide facility. And so we're asking that even though it might not tie in and we don't want to slow down repairs and restorations of paving that's a couple inches thick in the, in the short term, we need to see this project move <coughs> forward into a priority level. And just kind of to wrap up that 56th Gamble and Ingra issue there, it's, it really cuts to the quick. At the very back of your packet, the very back page, there's a map. You'll see it's essentially a vortex that's created by uncertainty. And um, you have the Glen and Seward highways coming through there. You have the threat of the bridge that may or may never become coming through there. You have the municipal um, freight mobility issues coming through this section. We have all of the major transit facilities and user bases coming through the neighborhood and there's no plan for how they're going to coordinate. And the snafu, the break, the failure is at 5th, 6th Gamble and Ingra for all of it. What's going to happen? And so we are asking that DOT join us, that AMATS join us in requesting and, and moving a study for how we're going to move transportation through the corridor. We're not trying to be bullies or loud and fight against. We're trying to find a solution to this long-term question, and the neighborhood just can't wait until 2035 to begin asking this question. So the action before the body before was to direct the technical committee to move this as amendment one onto the tip. We would still like to see this moved onto the tip so it can start really being looked at by the people who are going to test your own models to verify the veracity of the information contained therein, and then for us to respond and have a real meaningful conversation. And so in your hands is this information, and we just ask for action and not delay. Please, you know, we, we need a safe facility through our neighborhood that is the state's number one transit facility. And without everybody working together, it's going to maintain its unsafe quality. And I literally watched a woman, a drunk woman, walk off the sidewalk in front of a car, a truck, a truck that was towing a boat. That poor guy driving that truck nailed that woman. There was nothing he could do. It's not safe, and we need it to be safe. So please move this forward. Thank you. Any other public comment on this informational item? Okay, seeing none. Thank you, Scott. Next up, we have South Anchorage and Hillside Intersection Study. Is that you, Kevin? That's me. Okay, Kevin Jackson is a project manager at DOT, and he has worked for the last several years to do a study of the Hillside area intersections, which we hear so much about, depending on who's driving which kid to school on which day. We hear different intersections. Kevin, can you take it from there? Yes. Um, this is a reconnaissance engineering study that looked at nine unsignalized intersections in town. Elmore at Coventry, Elmore at 84th, Abbott at Birch, Huffman at Pintail, Huffman at Elmore, Old Seward at DRM, and Old Seward at the southbound Seward Highway off-ramp, DRM at Elmore and Rabbit Creek at Golden View. <clears throat> The uh, things that triggered uh, these intersections to be looked at were side street volumes of 1,350 or greater vehicles per day, <clears throat> major roads, 5,400 vehicles per day or more, with one or more uh, severe crashes in a five-year period, or, or five or more angle or turning crashes in a one-year period. And the study methodology, they identified concerns and constraints, solutions, and did a cost-benefit analysis to rank the the various intersections with respect to one another. The first two were looked at together, that's Elmore at 84th and Elmore at Coventry. They're only about 800 feet apart. And the concerns here are um, very high volumes on Elmore and significant pedestrian uh, and side street uh, delay. And uh, the preferred alternative for Huffman, or I mean Elmore at 84th was a, a signal here with raised median. and. This is the preferred alternative for Elmore at Coventry. Uh, raised medians with pedestrian refuge islands and also uh, reducing the grade of the um, vertical curve uh, to improve uh, the sight distance on this. The next intersection we looked at was Abbott at Birch. I'm gonna speed through this. I think this, this is the preferred alternative on that one. <clears throat> I think uh, 
you guys have already seen a presentation on this. This is being included in the uh, Abbott Road reconstruction project. The next intersection I'd like to talk about is Huffman at uh, Pintail. The concerns here are um, there's a pattern of angle crashes, although they're not um, above average, but there's uh, a lot of congestion associated with Grace Christian School. And uh, the preferred alternative here is a, is a roundabout. And the next intersection is Huffman at Elmore. Um, the concerns here are higher than um, average crash rate here with drivers 16 to 18 overrepresented. And uh, this was the preferred alternative uh, there around about as well. The next uh, intersection is Old Seward at Diarman. Concerns here are limited sight distance for Diarman and uh, there is a pattern of angle crashes but uh, not above the average. And uh, our uh, consultant looked at a number of uh, possible uh, mitigation measures, but at the end of the day, um, the recommendation was a no build. The, none of the alternatives penciled out. And with the recommendation to just keep monitoring it, and uh, you know, if a, if a problem develops in the future, maybe we'd come back to it. Old Seward Highway at the Seward Highway southbound off ramp. Concerns here are traffic's backing up on the off ramp about 500 feet, and uh, those queues are expected to increase over time. And uh, the preferred alternative here is a uh, median acceleration lane to allow folks to get up to speed before they merge onto Rabbit Creek. <clears throat> the next intersection looked at was Diarman at Elmore. Concerns here are higher than average crash rate with uh, um, drivers 16 to 18 overrepresented, like you'd think. Um, at the end of the day, the problem here is not with the intersection of Elmore and Diarman, it's with the high school or the school entrance. So the recommendation for the intersection is no build with the recommendation to, uh, you know, analyze what can be done there at the school entrance. And the last one is Strap Creek at Golden View. And um, <clears throat> here we've got uh, uh, higher than average crash rate, congestion in the AM associated with the school, and uh, it's expected to uh, increase over time. This is the preferred alternative. It's a roundabout shifted to allow the grades to be reduced coming into the roundabout. And um, we recognize that, you know, traffic, it's kind of tough to slow down and come to a stop when you're coming downhill, but um, the driver's going to have to change their behavior. And we'll, uh, this is, <clears throat> excuse me, I think that they could incorporate some high friction surface treatment in with this happens. Excuse me. And uh, let's see. These are the recommendations of Rabbit Creek at Golden View. And as I said earlier, Huffman at Elmore and Huffman at Pintail would be done in conjunction with each other due to their close proximity. And Abbott at Birch is being incorporated into the Abbott Road project. And Elmore at 84th, Elmore at Coventry uh, at a $6.5 million estimated cost. Going forward, the study, we're, we're completing that. It's and going to close the project and wait for funding to be identified. Uh, are there any questions? I'm sure there'll be a few. Thanks, Kevin. That's very brief. Appreciate it. Yeah. Mr. Flynn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and this may be outside the scope of your study, but to what extent do you look to the LURSAs to help fund these projects? To, to the local road service areas to fund these projects. I know they're state roads, but they're within the road service areas. I, I can't speak to that. You know, zero. I think that may be something we're going to have to spend a little more time on in the years ahead, Mr. Chairman. Oh, I guess you're right, yeah. yeah. Um, second question. When you were speaking of, I think it was like OS in 84th, you mentioned reducing the elevation to improve. There's a vertical curve as you, uh, as, as vehicles are coming south towards Coventry, there's a crest vertical curve that if we were to lower that grade, it'd, it'd improve uh, sight distance. Right now it meets minimums, but not desirables. 
you know, rough order of magnitude of if, it, if that project were a million dollars, I know it's more than that. <laughs> what percentage of that would be the vertical curve diminishment? Anyone, you have? I don't have that. I do not have that. I could get back to you. Um, I'd be just curious. It's one of those, we, that, that type of adjustment shows up periodically in projects. And I'm curious about the cost benefit. So. Okay. Anything else, Mr. Lee? That's all. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Mr. Steele, any questions? Um, it's a lot of work on the hillside. Um, all at one time, and, and we don't seem to be making the deadlines on some of those because of going back to the drawing board. Can I, can I kind of find this a little bit? This this study is a reconnaissance level study, which is just kind of an overview type yeah. study, which was really primarily intended to help um, give us a hierarchy of need on these projects and I think that at some point in the report I don't know if it was presented here but there's kind of an identification there of which ones we should attack first so it wasn't intended that these would all go together yeah the the uh, the one in golden view um, is that that's the roundabout that was offset yes yeah and that's offset to the south yes that's not to say that you know when if funding were to become available and design were to begin, you know, as Rob was stating, you know, it's a reconnaissance. There were no surveyors out there. You know, it's it's a planning level thing. I guess well, something has to be done on that. Yeah, I want to clarify that. You know, I've <coughs> spent a fair amount of time out there talking to people, and it's like I said earlier, kind of halfway joking, but really not. Is that everybody thinks their school is the worst school in town, and so every single parent you talk sure. to says. You know, it's Pintail is the worst, no Elmore is the worst, no Birch <coughs> Road is the worst. It depends if they got a kid going to Grace or they got a kid going to South or going to service, you know. Right. And, and so this was our attempt to try to quantify it in some way. We'd come back and say, well, no, really, your school isn't the worst. You know, this guy's school is the worst. But I think I'll probably get the my kid's school. <laughs> <laughs> Well, as we age out of it, it becomes less important. I'll admit, I didn't care less about this than I did 10 years ago. But, um, but it, it is an attempt to try to quantify that so that we don't just get, have every single person arguing that their school yeah. is the worst. There are some issues out there. But almost every, you know, almost every one of those is related in some way to a school pattern, you know, whether it's the age of the drivers, the location. I mean, it's that 15 minutes in the morning and the afternoon is just brutal for, for all those schools. I mean, and we can't design a system that will handle that 15 minute serve. That's the advantage of living on the hillside. Well, yeah, I haven't really used that one, but I'll try next time. I have a heated meeting. <laughs> okay. Ms. Highland? I just have a question because I can't remember. Are these projects already in the TIP? No. Well, Abbott is. Yeah, Abbott. So the these Abbott most likely have to get scored and nominated mm -hmm. and then ranked and then if they make the cut, we get in the cut. So just to. And you can see the benefit cost ratios aren't incredibly high. But just for, thanks for the clarification. Um, I have a question. Do, do any of these qualify for HSIP funding then? Based I believe on that? that we're looking into that. I, and I, if I remember right, I think Huffman at Elmore uh, is the most likely candidate. Is that so right? We might have one or two of them that meet HSIP criteria. Yeah, the main. In which case they'd be funded outside of yeah. emails. Severe crashes are the main focus of that program, and Huffman and Elmore has the most severe crash history. Okay. Is that how does that compare to other parts of Anchorage? Is that I mean, is that high just for that within the study or high period? Well, Huffman and Elmore is probably another feature about these intersections is they have enough competing volume. It's they're some of the few busier unsignalized intersections in the city where there's lane conflict and Huffman and Elmore is at the top of the list for just competition and crashing. <coughs> okay. Thanks, Kevin. Yep. We'll let you go. I sense waning interest here <laughs> by the chairman. Oh, no. Um, 2014 fourth quarter obligation report. I didn't see oh, Mr. Lyon. Mr. Young Lano. <laughs> Okay. Yes, uh, hello, I'm Aaron yogan -Alen. I'm the Anchorage Area Planner for DOT, and I'm filling in uh, to help out with the AMATS position uh, for a little while until they fill that position. 
So before you is the fourth quarter obligation report. And it's the final obligation report for the TIP uh, 11 through 14. So there's just a really quick couple of things I want to go over and then uh, have you guys ask questions if you have any. So looking at the top of the report, we made a quick adjustment to it where we've added the totals. So you can do a side-by-side -side comparison to see how we are doing or how we did. So the first thing we have is how much the AMATS allocation really is. It's 24.9 million. Then we have how much we actually obligated, including de-obligations, which is about 26.2 million. Then we have some advanced construct, which I'll get to in a second, uh, which is 8.6 million, uh, allowing us to have a total of 34.9 million dollars for FY14. Now the uh, advanced construct, there's two of them. If you look a little lower, G5, there was 4.2 million AC from 15 for O'Malley Road reconstruction. And then there was 4.4 million AC from 15 for the pavement replacement program. And that's it. Okay. So basically this is our final summation for the 14 year. And I guess if I can try to paraphrase what you said is we spend all of our money and we spend a little bit of 15's money in 14. Yes, we did. Okay, thank you. Mr. Flynn, further I'd say we spent a lot bit of 15's money in 14. 30% plus or minus eight. I know we use AC to make sure we get everything obligated, but this seems a little on the heavy side to me, Mr. Chairman. Okay. So I would be delighted to be having this report a year from now and seeing a much lower AC number. Yeah, and I think, let me speak to, not that we're really having a debate here, but um, O'Malley Road, for example, we just got to the right-of-way phase earlier, and we just had an opportunity to start acquiring the right-of-way to move the project schedule ahead. So it's money that we would have spent in 15 anyway on right-of-way, but we're just trying to get ahead three months on the right-of-way phase, so hopefully we can get it constructed. So it's not like it's a, a, a change in any strategy or anything else. It was just for once we actually got something done a few minutes early. So. It's kind of a success story in a way if you look at it that way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Mr. Chairman, you may not be in the right job. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure a lot of people think that. <laughs> you might want to think about mine. <laughs> okay, uh, Mr. Sorry. Steele. <laughs> Any further comments or questions? Yes. Thank you. Well, no. Thanks, Aaron. So much better. Um, we have our next thing is the 2014 federal planning cert review. Is that you, Mr. Yeah, Warren? real quickly. Okay. So uh, I passed out this little flyer there that talks about the certification certification review uh, every four years. The FHWA and FTA, Federal Highways and Federal Transit, come up and they uh, look over everything we're doing to certify as to whether or not we're following all their rules and regulations related to federal transportation planning. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that they ask us to do is uh, have a public meeting where the public is invited to come in and tell us all the wonderful things that we've been doing the last four years. So March 3rd, 2015, in this room from 5 to 6.30 will be that uh, public meeting. We also handed out uh, the schedule. Now this is for the schedule for the feds to sit down with uh, all the planners, etc., in my group um, on the uh, Tuesday, March 3rd, and Wednesday, March 4th, uh, two full days of meetings where they go through the, what started out as a 25-page questionnaire and ended up as a 90-page response, because we like to give them lots of stuff. So um, so just letting you know, that's what's occurring. We expect that uh, since we bumped up the TAC meeting next month to next Thursday, that they will hang around and give us a quick, quick uh, how did it go sort of thing without any, you know, saying that it could change in the next months as they finalize it, but that's kind of the general idea. Typically, we get a final response from them a few months or a month or so after their visit up here. So, and we'll certainly share that as we go. And the cert review happens how often? Every four years. Four years, thank you. Mr. Flynn, any further questions? Mr. Steele? So, no. I'm just blowing off the public on these things. Does anybody have any comments on the uh, cert review? Okay. Um, item E, updated MTP integrated task schedule. Ms. Underwood is going to present that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just Thank real you. quickly, this is also is an update of a, a live schedule that we gave you a year ago in January. And the big thing that's happened since then is we're now doing an interim MTP update because we have some things fell behind. 
um, work that's due at the end of this year. And Aaron Yonganalan with DOT staff and I have been working on the financial plan. That's the key first piece. And the TAC will be hopefully approving the uh, assumptions for um, revenue, capital revenue and inflation factors, and we'll be bringing that to you in March. And I'd like to compliment Aaron because he's been absolutely wonderful on this. He's a whiz at the Excel spreadsheet, which is rather complicated, and his, his help has been very valuable. So um, okay. we hope to have a draft, a public review draft by June 1st. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, let's find out, Mr. Flynn. Are there any significant changes to this that we should pay attention to? Somehow I failed to memorize the one we got here. Well, the, the next MTP is not technically due till May 25th of 2016. But, but we're the, the TAC, you all passed a resolution, or accepted the TAC's resolution to use the 2035. Um, the interim, I remember that part. But oh, okay. What, what about this for the new MTP has changed significantly? Well, well, this will buy us time. So the goal then is to get a contractor on both board for the 2040 MTP. Is that the one you're asking? Yeah. Um, by say June first, and then to get that done by the end of 2017, not take the whole four years that that will we will be accorded by doing the interim MTP. So, but that gives us a little bit of wiggle room for extra public involvement, and to do things right with the model update and other things, not rush these other related tasks. Okay. Mr. Flynn, anything else? Mr. Steele. Update me on the population issue. Did we get that all squared away with regards to we did. and everything? That was in the minutes. <laughs> I failed to pick up on that. Uh, but that's, we agreed to disagree. Is that the theory? No, we agreed. I think that we resolve the modeling issue, if that's what you're referring to, on the Matsu KMATS model boundary condition. Yep. I think we agreed to all set. You didn't highlight it for me. But Sorry. although that did uh, push, it's about six months behind what we thought we were going to be with that, which is uh, perfectly all right. But that means that it's good that we're doing the NMP because the model would not have been ready in time. Everything would have been in a crunch. Okay. So this is a good strategy. Ms. Heil, any further questions? Okay, thank you for your update. I second. Okay. Um, it seems like forever, but we've only been here for an hour. Uh, other, <laughs> any other items that anybody would care to bring up at this point? Committee comments? Yes. Mr. Flynn? You take too much joy in these meetings, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. <laughs> I'll try to stop smiling. Uh, <laughs> nothing, sir. Uh, Mr. Steele. I have not have no comments. Mr. Peterson, you've been kind of muted over there. Do you have anything you'd like to say now that you've seen this? No, not, right now. not at this time. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Heil. Yes. Um, I just want you to know that, let everybody know that Alice Edwards has um, been appointed the Deputy Commissioner for the Department of Environmental Conservation and um, regrets that she wasn't able to be here today to say goodbye. But Does she prefer that we send her condolences or congratulations? <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> so she wanted me to, to tell you guys she had really enjoyed um, being on a mass. Um, Who's going to decide on her, her replacement for, are you? I am here temporarily as um, I'm. Um, You're off an arc. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not an unusual role. So there's no um, plan yet. No, what, uh, they're rapidly going to be looking to replace the director. So the way the operating room is is it's the commissioners designate. So, I mean, technically she could still stay on it if that's what's decided. If and when they um, fill the director and what that is, what they decide to do, but um, they're actively looking for a new director until until then <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll you got me a couple of switching hats <laughs> okay. very good. good thanks and congratulations to Alice from all of us it's good for her okay I think we've got our next meeting is on March 26th at 1 30 back in this room and the technical advisory committee meeting is next week already I guess on the 5th at 2.30, which I believe is still out on the Tudor Road, is that correct? It is. Okay. So with that, we are adjourned. Good luck on your shirt.